Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the homestead. It seems like fall has finally arrived. 52 degrees this morning, and they're saying down into the 40s by next week. So that's good news. We were getting really sick of the 90 degree weather. So let's start off the day by letting all the animals out and seeing how they love this cool weather. I know I haven't given you guys a lot of updates on the quail over the summer. I do obviously still have them, but it's been a hard summer for the quail. It has been so hot here, and being that they're inside, even though I keep a fan on them, it has been really rough. I actually lost about five or six of them over the summer due to the heat, and so really I've just been maintaining them. I haven't really hatched any out over the summer. Uh, which was a real bummer uh, but now that the weather's starting to cool down i'm hoping to do it some more um, i'll be honest i'm also just not real happy with having to raise them in cages indoors like that so i'm starting to get my brain going about other ways that we can do quail because i do enjoy having them uh, but i just don't feel like this is necessarily the best way to be raising them so i'm trying to come up with something that I think will be even better. So I'll keep you guys updated as I go along and we'll see where it goes. For now, let's feed the chickens. see if the turkeys are ready to come out this morning. Good morning turkeys. Can you fit? One at a time. One at a time. Oh. The broad-breasted turkeys are getting so big, they barely fit through the little coop door. A couple weeks ago, our youngest female goat, Annabelle, started escaping from the electric fenced area that they have. So we made a hard decision to sell her. We just recently found a new owner for her, so Annabelle will be going to her new home early next week. Until then, we have Annabelle and her mom, Rory, in a separate fenced in area, actually where the boys normally are just until we can uh, get Annabelle to a new area and then Rory will go back in the electric fenced area. Hopefully she'll remember that it's electrified or we have another big problem on our hands. Anyway, that's why I have two goats in a separate area right now. And we think Annabelle is gonna have a great new home. Well, you may notice that the trailer for the pigs is gone. We're down to just two pigs now, Pee Wee and Penny. The pig that we were calling Big Mama, we took to the butcher earlier this week for the customer who purchased her. She was a great looking pig. It went so well loading her in the trailer. 
we actually were able to get her loaded in the night before so the morning that it was time to go we were able to just hook it up to the truck and take her off to the butcher and it worked out so well we didn't get that recorded because we loaded her up after dark so uh, but it went really well and we'll definitely be doing it that way again in the future if we need to take more pigs to the butcher now the ones that we keep for ourselves we process those right here on the farm sarah and i do those ourselves so there's no need to transport them we do feel like that is the best way to do it so that there's not much stress on the pigs at all uh, but obviously not everybody is equipped to be able to butcher their own pig so sometimes you have to take one away I also want to show you guys a new improvement that I've made to the pig pen based on your suggestions. Let's walk over this way and I'll show you what's going on. So over the summer we feed the pigs a lot of produce out of the garden and now that we have our cow, we're actually feeding them a lot of soaked grains as well. We put the grains in a bucket and then we add some milk and we let it sit for at least a day to really soak up and so that the milk can curdle in the bucket that pigs absolutely love it. Normally when we're feeding just produce, I just put it on the ground and let the pigs eat it off of there. A lot of you have told me that you think that that's not a good idea uh, because of parasites, but I just never had a way to do anything else because if I just put it in a bowl or something like that on the ground, they just tipped it over and ate it off the ground anyway. So we were at our local farm store the other day and I saw these cement feeders and I thought those would be absolutely perfect for the pigs because they're so heavy that the pigs can't knock them over. And now that we're feeding the milk, we need something that, you know, if I just put it on the ground, it's just going to soak into the ground. So this is going to be perfect. We've had it for a couple days now and it's working out great. I've got a bucket of grain. Let's see how they like it. Well, I would say that that's a winner. I think that this is gonna be a great long-term investment for all the pigs that we raise in the future too, because they're just so strong. You just can't use things that you would use for other animals because they're just so big. So this is gonna be awesome. I'm excited to have it. Well, all of the animals are fed except for Hope. She still needs her morning grain so we can get her milked. She is so patient with us in the morning. She just waits for us to come out and Get ready to milk her out. But first I wanna show you guys all of the equipment that we use, how we set it up, and how we're running our milking machine off of solar power since we don't have electricity back here. I know a lot of you have been interested, so let's go get everything out and we'll review it and then we'll show you how it works when we actually come out to Milk Hope. Well, before we get ready to go out and milk today, I thought I would show you guys all of the pieces of our milker and our milker setup so that you can understand what we're doing when we actually get out to the barn to start milking the cow. There's really three main components to our milking system. Now we run our system off of a solar powered generator. So that's this right here. We also have a vacuum pump that we use. This is a single stage four CFM vacuum pump and then the milker itself. I'm gonna go over each part with you a little more in depth so that you can understand how each part makes the system work the way it's supposed to. So the first part of our system is the solar power generator. Now this is something that we didn't get just for milking the cow. We've actually had this now for a couple years and it is an awesome tool to have on the homestead for a lot of different reasons. We mainly have this for power outages and for powering the things that we need inside of the little guest cabin that we have here on our, on our property. Now most of the time when we're using this for milking, afterwards I'll bring it in the house and I'll plug it into the wall to charge it back up but it can also be charged through solar panels. So if the power were to be out for an extended period of time, we still have a way to charge it up. I have two 100 watt solar panels that I use for this and it'll charge it you know, throughout the day and it'll be ready to use by the next day. So 
I really like this system. Our original plan for our milking setup was to actually run like a 250 foot extension cord from our chicken coop out to the milking barn. But I was a little leery about doing that because first of all, it's a long extension cord and it would have to run on the ground where you know the goats could be near it and all of that. So that just didn't seem like a good solution. So this has worked out really well for us. Now, if you guys wanna know more about this setup, uh, I'll leave a link to it down below. The company that makes this is called Energy. This is called the Energy Apex Generator. It's a really nice system. Go and check it out. Now the next part of our milking setup is our vacuum pump. Now I actually bought the vacuum pump and the milker together uh, as kind of a package on eBay. And I'll show you, and I'll go over each part separately for you. Now again, this is a single stage, four CFM vacuum pump. Um, not a very powerful pump, but it does a great job with our surge bucket milker. A couple important things to know about these uh, smaller vacuum pumps is first of all, they do use oil. You can buy oilless vacuum pumps these days, but they're a lot more expensive. So this one does use oil. You have to always make sure that there's enough oil in it. There's a little window down here that just shows you the level. So not a big deal. Just always have some extra on hand. And then the other thing is, it's very important to have a pressure gauge on your pump. You want to make sure that there's not getting too much pressure in the lines and sucking too hard on the cow's teats, or you can actually damage the teats. And you could damage them enough that it would make some of the quarters actually not milkable. So this setup, I bought this all together like this. It came, it had the pressure gauge with it. I just had to install it. And then it's also got kind of a pressure relief valve right here that you can adjust if you're getting too much pressure in your lines. So this is a good setup. And normally this will just stay out in the barn with us all of the time. We don't bring this back and forth every day like we do the milker and the generator. So the last and most important piece of our milker setup obviously is the milker itself. Now the surge bucket milker was probably the most popular milker made back in the day when, you know, there were a lot of smaller commercial dairies. These milkers uh, were used, you know, a lot during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. They kind of started to go out after that as bigger, bigger dairies started to come around. But these things are just a workhorse. They actually made them all the way from 1922 all the way up to 1995. We bought this completely refurbished on eBay. We found a good deal on it. Again, it came with everything we needed, including the pump, and it was you know, a great deal. So check on eBay. There are people out there that just work on these and resell them, and you can find a fantastic deal. So there are several parts to the milker. Let's go over each part so you have a better understanding of how it works. So the first part of the milker is the bucket. This holds five gallons of milk at a time. And these are a really nice, heavy duty bucket. I mean, this thing, even though it's old, you can tell that it is built to last. The next piece of the setup here is the, is the lid. So the lid goes on like this. There's a little valve right here that will move up and down when the milk to help the pulsator work. The pulsator is a very important part of this entire setup. Now we actually have two pulsators. The, the first pulsator that we have is the original Surge pulsator that would have come with this when it was brand new. But this has been refurbished with all new gaskets and everything inside. And so the way that this works is it would go on top of the milker like this, lock into place, and then all of your vacuum lines hook to this, to the back here goes to the pump and these go to the inflations which are on the cow. The reason that we replaced this is that even though these this one works these are notorious for breaking down just because they're getting older and it's kind of older technology. Um, so we're just going to keep that one as a backup in case something happens to the other one that we bought. So we just recently upgraded to this new pulsator which is called an insert interpulse a pulsator and it goes on exactly the same way but it's made with instead of brass uh, fittings inside which are what make the other one wear out this is all made with nylon and, and things inside so that it just lasts a lot longer uh, you don't have to have all of the care that you needed to have with the original uh, surge 
pulsators. So this goes on like this, your vacuum line goes on the back, and then your inflations are here on the front. Your inflations hook to the lid of your milker and to the pulsator. These are vacuum lines, and these are the lines where the milk will actually travel through and go down into the bucket. These parts that go onto the cow themselves, these are what are called inflations. They're basically a metal outside with a rubber inside. The cow's teats will actually go down inside, and as the pulsator starts to work, you'll hear it kind of go and that actually makes the inside of this inflate so it mimics what it would be like to have a calf actually sucking on the teat of the cow. That pulsation or the mimicking of a calf being on the cow is very important. That's what the pulsator does. The pulsator is what makes that motion to mimic the calf. If you didn't have this, it would just be a, a straight suction going onto the cow and that can be pretty dangerous if you use a setup like that, you really want one that is mimicking having a calf. That will do a lot less damage to your cow's teats over time. Right now, we only use two inflations at a time. We milk the two back quarters on our cow, and then when those are done, we move them up and we milk the two front quarters. When you buy a setup like this, it will come with all four. And if you would like to, you can, you can milk all four quarters at one time. We choose not to do that because it seems less cumbersome to just do two at a time and it works just fine for us. So we're gonna gather all of this up, put it in our garden cart that we use to haul it out to the milking barn, and then we're gonna get ready to show you guys exactly how all of this works on the cow. Now when we go into milk, before I bring all of the equipment in, we actually lock the goats up on the other side of our paddock here. We have this cross fence so it's two separate areas. Goats just want to jump on everything and be in the way. So while we're milking, we need to be able to concentrate on what we're doing and keep our equipment clean. So we always keep them on the other side until we're done. Sometimes they eat and then run right back up here and I have to hurry to make sure they stay over there. So once we've got everything out here, the first thing that I do when I get out here is I plug in our pump. In the morning when we milk, it's already light out. So that's all I have to do is plug in the pump. At night when we milk, it's usually already dark or pretty close to dark. So I've also installed an LED shop light in here and the generator that will actually run that as well. So we can turn that on, so that way at night when we milk, it's nice and bright in here and we can still see what we're doing. So once we have the pump plugged into the generator, the last thing to do before we can let hope in here is to actually plug the pump into the milker. So the, this is the way we normally just leave the pump out here all the time. It just sits here and I have this hose, this is the vacuum line that hooks up to the milker. I just hang that like this to keep it clean. This never comes in contact with the milk. This is just for the vacuum line itself. So uh, it doesn't have to stay as clean as the parts that actually come in contact with the milk. So we'll just set the, the milker here on the stand. I just hang the inflations up over the edge like this so that they stay clean. And then this line just hooks and slides onto the back of the pulsator just like that and now we're all ready to let hope in here and you'll see what a good girl she is she's so trained she knows exactly what to do when she gets up here and then as soon as she's in i'll lock her in place and sarah can start cleaning her ready hope Just put this over like this 
and now she's locked into place. She can move around, she just can't back up and leave. Before we can start milking, I need to wash her teeth and the, this part of her udder here to make sure everything's clean when we're milking. I just use a solution of a natural dish soap and a little bit of bleach and just a couple of rags. I make sure to wash each teat really well to make sure they're nice and clean. Sometimes overnight she has laid down in some yucky stuff, so sometimes it's pretty dirty. I just need to take my time and make sure everything is done really nicely and so that everything is safe. Now that she's all cleaned up, I'm just gonna squirt a little bit of milk out of each teeth just to get any old milk or any bacteria out of there. And so that won't go into our milking bucket. She is ready to be milked. She's really letting down, so let's get going. All right, so I just set the milker there on the stand. We'll turn on the pump. We can kink off these lines. And I push down just a little bit on the cover to help build up the pressure inside the tank. And then soon you'll start to hear the pulsator start pulsating. Once you hear that, you know it's ready to put the inflations on to the cow. So we just milk two, two sides, at, or two teats at a time. So we start with the back because they take the longest because they have the most milk. We'll put one on there. And one there. And you'll see the milk start to flow through the lines into the tank. Now a lot of people ask why we use a machine for only one cow. And the, the answer is because it keeps everything a lot cleaner. Uh, we do sell some of our raw milk here locally, so this keeps everything nice and clean. You can see the milk never has the ability to come in contact with anything that would make it, you know, dirty. So that's what we do. We just put them on like this. We'll let this run. Usually about five minutes is all it takes. And then we'll switch them to the front two and we'll do those. And that's all there is to it. These milking machines were originally designed to hang from a strap that was over the cow so that if they moved around, the milker would move around and they wouldn't have a chance to step on the lines and knock them off their teeth. These days, a lot of people, including us, are just using it the way that we're doing now. Um, it just works well for us and I don't know, we just like it this way. Maybe someday we'll try the straps, but for now, this is working well. We know that she's milked out on uh, some of the quarters when the milk stops coming out and when there are wrinkles starting to form in the bottom of her teeth or in the bottom of her udder here. These aren't quite milked out yet, but they're not hard and full. You can see they're starting to empty and get a lot, uh, there's a lot less milk in there. Okay. This back quarter here is done, so I'm gonna switch. I pinch off the suction here and I break the suction with my finger on her teeth, pull off and reattach it to the new teeth. I'll do the same thing with this one now. Simple as that. This back quarter is done, but this front one isn't. So I'm gonna pull off the back one and I have a plug for the inflation. That way the pressure stays up while this one finishes. It looks like that one is done too. So now we just need to turn the machine off. We're done milking. So once we're all done and the pump is off, the first thing that I do before we do anything with Hope is we just disconnect the, the milker and I take it back out, put it right on our cart to get it ready to take back inside. Oftentimes, if she's going to pee or poop, it's during this time, right after we get done milking. So I wanna make sure this stuff is out of the way, doesn't get any splash on it. The last thing that we do is we use a teat dip with her. 
This will uh, prevent any bacteria from getting up inside there and will actually coat the outside with kind of a lotion, an emollient. Now research recently has shown that you shouldn't actually strip out anything else that's in those teats because you could actually be introducing bacteria up into there. So we're just using the teat dip and that should keep everything safe and sterile until next time. We have to get her out before she goes to the bathroom. No. Good job, thank you. What a good girl. Careful. There you go. Good girl. Thank you for the great milk this morning. All right, we need to get the milk in the house so we can strain it and then get it in the refrigerator and starting to chill. You want to do that as quickly as you can. So let's go inside and we'll see how much milk we ended up with for this morning's milking. All right, so now that we're back in the house, I'll show you guys real quickly what we do to get ready to clean everything. So the first thing that we need to do is disconnect all of the lines. Now, because Sarah and I kind of work together on most things around the homestead, it becomes a lot easier process to do to keep up with all of this. So basically when we get back in the house, my job is to take care of straining the milk and all of that. And Sarah's job is to clean all of this stuff up. So what I do is I just take this apart, pull off the milking lines. They go right into a sink of soapy water. The inflations stay connected to these lines. These are vacuum lines. You don't ever want to get water in these vacuum lines. Sarah will wash down inside of this rubber part of the inflation, but you never want to wash underneath that in the metal part because that also will suck water up into your vacuum pump. So you don't want to, you don't want to get water in there. So what we do is we leave this all hooked up just like this because then everything is closed off where the water shouldn't be. So we'll take these over and we'll put, I just set the pulsator up on the counter and put the inflations down into the sink and she'll wash just the parts that can get wet. We'll take off the cover of the milker and the little check valve, we'll put that down into the sink and she'll just wash all of that while I'm over here straining the milk and seeing how much we got for the day. Now, as far as a strainer goes, what we use is a food grade bucket and then a stainless steel funnel. Down in the bottom of the funnel is a screen. And then we also use these, what are called milk filters. It's a real fine filter, kind of like a coffee filter, uh, but it flows through a lot faster than a coffee filter. That goes down in the bottom of the funnel. And then there's just this little clip that pushes it down and locks it into place. Put the funnel in the bucket and we'll just pour our milk in and see how much we got for the day. Now that filter will get out if there were any you know, small hairs or particles of dirt, anything like that. There shouldn't be any of that using a milker because it's a closed system, but every once in a while you might find a stray hair or something in there. But all in all, this is a very clean system compared to hand milking into just an open bucket. After all of the milk has run through the filter, I take the funnel and I set it back over into the milker like this. And then once all of the kind of bubbles go away on the filter, we'll inspect that and just make sure that there's nothing that looks out of, you know, normal on there. That could be a sign of mastitis in the cow, uh, but we've never seen anything like that. So now that we've got all of our milk in the bucket, it's time to start putting it into half gallon jars. So we always start with nice clean jars and I use a canning funnel in the top so we can just pour this right in. And we'll see how much we got for the day. Typically, she produces more, you know, our morning milking is the bigger milking. 
because it's been a little bit longer we don't exactly go exactly 12 hours in between milking so That was a good milking. I'm gonna put a little bit more back in these. But it looks like we're gonna get just almost exactly a gallon and a half of milk this morning. A gallon and a half, I would consider that a good milking. We average about two and a half gallons a day. So my guess is we'll get about a gallon tonight. Now all we do is cap these up. I use a piece of just masking tape and I write the date on if it was morning or night and then we get them right into the refrigerator. So you guys I hope you enjoyed learning all about our milking system and our milking process. If you're not a subscriber yet and you are enjoying our videos please make sure to hit the subscribe button below. Also the best way that you can help us here on the homestead is to share our videos. Until next time thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.